In this lecture, we will study the concept of steady-state error. Steady-state error is the difference between the input and output of a system for a prescribed test input as time tends to infinity. Test inputs used for steady-state error analysis and design are typically step or ramp functions. Step inputs represent constant inputs and thus are useful in determining the ability of a control system to position itself with respect to a stationary target. An antenna position control is a good example of a system that can be tested for accuracy using step inputs. Ramp inputs represent inputs with linearly increasing amplitude, such as position input with a constant velocity. These waveforms can be used to test a system's ability to follow a linearly increasing input or to track a constant moving target. For example, a control system that attracts a satellite that moves across the sky at a constant angular velocity would receive a ramp input. In the same way, parabola inputs, whose second derivative are constants, represent constant acceleration inputs to position control systems and can be used to represent accelerating targets such as a missile. In this lecture, we will investigate a type of steady-state error that is caused by the incapability of a system to follow these particular types of inputs. Note, however, that changes in the reference input can cause unavoidable errors during transient periods as well, and may cause steady-state errors. Imperfection in the system components, including static friction, backlash, as well as aging or deterioration. This will also cause steady-state errors, but it will be dealt with in a different lecture. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the concept of error and disturbance signals, calculate the steady-state error of a given system, and analyze the influence of control loop gains in the steady state response of a system. Let's first consider two examples. In this example, we have a rolling mill. The objective of the controller is to ensure that the rolls of this mill always turn at a constant speed. However, when a steel bar comes to the rolls and touches them, a load is applied to the rolls immediately, and the speed of the rolls will decrease. How can the speed of the controllers be controlled to minimize this disturbance? and make sure that the speed is always constant. Here is another example. Assume that a robotic arm controls a laser that operates on the patient's eye. This is a clear example of position control, where the robot arm is expected to track the position of the eye and always follows a specific point in the eye. How can we make sure that the controller that controls this robot has a zero steady state error, that is, it always goes to the, its intended position? To answer these two questions, we need to introduce the idea of closed-loop control. In closed-loop control, we have a process to be controlled, a controller, a measurement, and a way to compare the input and the output. Assume that the desired output of the system is R of S, and the desired output is Y of S. The way a closed-loop control works is to create an error signal, R of S minus Y of S, that is, the difference between the desired and the actual output, and send that error to the controller. The controller will then take actions based on the error and will now apply an input to the process that will make the output change according to the error. The output is measured and compared with the input. To understand the advantages of closed-loop control, we need to look at open-loop control. In the absence of a controller and without feedback, any disturbance is directly applied to the output. Consider the function g of s, that's the plant to be controlled. An input is given to the plant. Any disturbance acting on the plant will act as a, another input and will be reflected in the output Y of S. Even with a controller, C of S, that now receives an input R of S and outputs a command to the plant, the disturbance is directly applied to the plant and the output is directly affected by it. There is no way for C of S to minimize the effects of T of S without actively monitoring Y of S. And that's the idea of closed-loop control. Now, instead of using this open-loop architecture, we can measure Y of S and then take actions based on the difference between Y of S and R of S. A closed-loop system compares the output with the desired input value and creates an error signal, E of S. The error signal is defined as the desired input minus the actual output. Ideally, the error signal is always zero. The controller now will take actions based on the error, not on the absolute value of the desired output, as in the case of an open-loop system. Notice now that if a disturbance is applied to the plant, the effects of the disturbance will make Y of S change, and that will directly affect the error. Thus, the effects of the disturbance can be compensated for because the disturbance affects the output 
and the output is now measured and compared with the input. However, by measuring the output, we also introduce noise to the system, modeled here as N of S. Any form of measurement will be subjected to noise. The noise is also injected into the system now, and you need to make sure that the controller minimizes the effect of noise in the output. H of S represents the transfer function of the sensor. The most important one is the ability of a system to improve rejection of disturbances. A open loop control cannot do that because the disturbance cannot be modeled and cannot be accounted for in a controller. Notice here that even though the controller is not necessarily using a model of T of S, the disturbance affects the output, which affects the error. And because now the controller takes actions based on the error, it will compensate for changes in the output due to the disturbance. Another advantage of closed-loop control is the sensitivity to variations in the parameters of the process. Open-loop control requires a precise knowledge of the process to be controlled, whereas in closed-loop control, if the process changes during operation, that will also create an error, and this error will be accounted for in the controller. Other advantages include noise attenuation and control over steady state and transient responses, including the steady state error, which is the focus of this lecture. Now, in order to understand the effect of the input, the disturbance, and the noise in the output, let's model the error in this system. Let's start by creating three different transfer functions, one for each input, that is, the desired input R, the disturbance T, and the noise N. For simplicity, we we'll assume that a function H of S is equal to 1. And let's start with the disturbance. We can set R to 0 and N to 0, and find a transfer function between Y of S and t of s. This transfer function is given here. If we now multiply the transfer function by the input, which in this case is t of s, we get the output yd. yd is the output of the system when only a disturbance, t of s, is applied. Now let's do the same, but at this time let's set n to 0 and t to 0. There is no noise and there is no disturbance. And now we can look for the transfer function between y and r. The transfer function is given here, and by multiplying that by R of S, we get the output that R of S creates, that is Y of R. That is the output of the system when there is no noise, there is no disturbance, and only a desired input is given to this control system. Lastly, we can set R to 0 and T to 0 and look at the transfer function between the noise and the output, that is, how the noise affects the output. Here is the transfer function. By multiplying that by N, we get YN, that is, the output created by injecting noise into the system. There are three inputs that will contribute to a single output. Because the system is linear, we can use the principle of a superposition and calculate the final output, which is a combination, a linear sum, of the effects of R, T, and N. That means that the output Y of S is simply the sum of YR, YN, and YD, the effect of the input in the output, the effect of noise in the output, and the effect of disturbance in the output. We can now replace the three functions that we calculated before and find the output function with all these three elements as inputs. The objective here is to evaluate how well the system works. For a system to work well, the output needs to go to the value of the input. We can now create an error as the difference between the desired output and the actual output. Y of S is the output of the system as a result of the, input, the three inputs, which is this part of the equation calculated in the previous slides. For the first two terms, they have R of S. R of S can be factored out, and this first term can be simplified, and the other two remain the same. The function at the bottom here now gives the error for the error of the system, that is the difference between the desired and the actual output. We see that the error is affected by three things, the input, the disturbance, and the noise. Something to notice here is that C of S, the controller transfer function, shows up in all these three terms. Our job as designers is now to define C of S such that the error tends to zero. If the error tends to zero, this means that the system always goes to its commanded value. How can we do that? To answer this question, we need to go back to the concept of magnitude of a transfer function. As we saw in lecture three, any transfer function we have a magnitude that depends on the frequency and sigma. This can be calculated by replacing s with j omega plus sigma. The magnitude of the transfer function depends now essentially 
on the frequency of operation of the system or the frequency of whatever crosses the controller transfer function. Let's look at the error function again. The first term has C of S in the denominator. In order to minimize the effect of changes in the input in the error, C of S needs to be very aggressive. That is, the magnitude of C of S should tend to infinity. And in that way, changes in the input will not affect the error. In the second term, we see C of S in the denominator again. Again, if C of S now, the magnitude of C of S tends to infinity, then the effect of the disturbance in the error is minimized. The third term represents the effect of noise in the error. The controller transfer function shows in the denominator and in the numerator. In order to minimize the effect of noise in the error, now the magnitude of Z of S needs to tend to zero. The two first objectives are in agreement, but the last one contradicts the first two. How can you solve this conflict? C of S must be large to minimize the influence of T of S and R of S. C of S must be small to minimize the influence of N of S. Consider the example we covered in the beginning with the mill. A disturbance will occur every time a steel bar touches the rows, and the measurement noise will always be present at a higher frequency. We can say that the frequency of disturbance is much smaller than the frequency of measurement noise. Thus, we can solve this conflict by making C of S large at a low frequencies, and this will make sure that the first two terms in the error is minimized. They both, they both occur at a low frequencies. Changes in the desired speed and disturbances are low frequencies. Noise is to be minimized as well, and noise occur at high frequencies. So now we can make C of S small at a high frequencies, and this will ensure the effect of noise in the error are minimized. Of course, this analysis depends on the application. In a closed loop system, we can distinguish two different responses. The first is called the transient response, and the second is called the steady state response. The transient response is the time the system takes before it settles at a constant value. When the system reaches that constant value, we say that the system has reached a steady state. We will deal with the transient response and the steady state response in two separate lectures. In this lecture, we are going to focus on steady state error. Assume, for instance, that the input to a system is a step function. The steady state error would be the difference between the input and the desired output when time tends to infinity. Using the function e of s that we created before, we can calculate the error in a steady state by using the final value theorem. That is the limit when s tends to zero of s times the error function e of s. If you now set n and t to zero, the error simplifies to this function. It's only a function of changes in the input. The steady state error can be obtained using the final value theorem by taking the limit of e times s when s tends to zero. If we assume that the input e of s is given here, assuming that the input is a step function, we can replace r of s with 1 over s, 1 over s cancels the s from the theorem, and we are left with 1 over 1 plus c0 plus g0, that is when s tends to 0. c0 g0 is called the DC gain of a transfer function. To understand the concept of steady state error in both open and closed loop systems, let's consider this example. The controller has a control parameter k divided by tau s plus 1, and the process transfer function is Ka over tau 1s plus 1. Let's calculate the steady state error for this open loop system. The error is defined as the input r minus the output y, and the y of s can be found by finding the transfer function y over r, which is Kka over tau s plus 1, tau 1, s plus 1. If we now multiply both sides of this equation by r of s, we get an expression for y of s. And the error can now be calculated by setting e of s equals to the desired output minus the actual output calculated here. Here we have the same expression, and let's assume that our input is a step input, 1 over s. The steady state error can now be calculated using the final value theorem. First, we can simplify the error function by factoring out r of s. And now applying the final value theorem, we know that the steady state error is the limit when s tends to 0 of s times e of s. E of s is 1 over s, this is the input, times 1 minus k k a over tau s plus 1, tau 1 s plus 1. 
these two s's will cancel. The steady state error is 1 minus kka. Ideally, the steady state error should be 0. The only way to make this 0 is by setting k equals to 1 over ka. Remember that a k is the controller gain, which is the only variable that a designer has control over. Thus, in order to properly control the steady state error and bring it to 0, one needs full knowledge of the plant because the, var because the value of ka is known. There is only one possibility to make the steady state error, that is k equals to 1 over ka. In practice, this is very hard to accomplish. Now let's consider the same system once again, but now let's close the loop. We add this feedback loop and let's calculate the steady state error. First we need to find the output of this closed loop system. The output can be found through the transfer function y over r, which in this case is kka over tau s plus 1, tau 1 s plus 1 plus kka, as covered in the last lecture. If you multiply both sides of this equation by r of s, we now have an expression for y of s. The error can now be defined as r of s, the desired output, minus the true output y of s. And now replace y of s with that expression, gives the expression for the error. We can factor out r of s, and now use the final value theorem to calculate the steady state error. Let's assume that the input is once again a step function, so r of s equals to 1 over s. The error in the steady state is the limit when s tends to 0 of the error function times s, and this simplifies to 1 minus kka over 1 plus kka. This further simplifies to 1 over 1 plus kka. It is impossible to make the steady state error 0. There is no value of k that makes the steady state error 0. However, if k tends to infinity, if k is a very large number, then the error tends to 0. Notice that this assumption doesn't rely on any knowledge of the plant itself, which is a big advantage compared to the previous open loop control method. In summary, for the open loop control system, the error was 1 minus kka. The only way this can go to 0 is by setting k equals to 1 over ka. This means that one needs to know exactly how the plant is and needs a very precise model of the plant. This is not always feasible. In the closed loop system, however, the steady state error is given by 1 over 1 plus kka. All we need to do here is to set k to a very large number and that will bring the steady state error to a very small number. Never zero, but a very small. That's the trade-off between the open and closed loop systems. Let's cover one last example of steady state error. For this example, consider a mass spring damper system as a mass that slides on a plane with friction B. The mass is connected to a spring with the stiffness coefficient is K. A force F of S is applied to the mass and the output is the displacement x of s. The objective here is to apply a force to the mass and make it move by a certain amount. We can consider an open and a closed loop approach. Let's just start with the open loop. We know that the transfer function x displacement divided by the force is 1 over ms squared plus vs plus k. So x of s, the output is f of s divided by ms squared plus bs plus k. And let's assume that the applied force here is simply f over s. f is the magnitude of the force and 1 over s is the step function. The final value of x of s or the position the mass reaches is the limit when s tends to 0 of x of s times s which is the limit when s tends to 0 of x of s, here it is, f of s is f over s times s from the theorem times 1 over ms squared plus vs plus k. And this gives f over ms squared plus vs plus k the final value of the displacement or the maximum displacement in this case that the mass reaches is x steady state equals to f over k. If you now want the mass to reach a certain position, let's call that xd for desired position, we can define the force that it needs to be applied as xd 
times k. And now with this, this relation, we can just find the open loop control approach. The input is the desired position xd times k, the stiffness constant, which serves as our control gain here. This is applied to 1 over, over, 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k, and the output is x. And here is the force applied. So with this analysis, we inverted the model. We know that if we apply now f equals to xd times k, x will tend to xd, and the error in the steady state is equal to zero. This only works provided that our control gain here has information about the plant, knows exactly what the value of k is, and we, in this way, revert the model so that the mass always goes to xd. This open loop control approach works provided that we know the model, we have access to these variables, and there is no disturbances applied to the system. If there is an external force acting on the mass, this relation doesn't hold, the open loop control approach doesn't hold. So we need to consider a closed loop control strategy, strategy instead. The objective here is to develop a closed loop control system to make the mass move by a certain amount by applying a force f of s. Let's call the desired position x of x d of s, the desired displacement. And now in a closed loop controller, we need to compare x d, the desired position, with the actual position, create a error function, and send this error to the controller. Let's create a block here. We'll deal with that later. The output of this controller now goes to the mass spring damper system, 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k, and the output is x of s that you are measuring and inputting it here. What goes in this box? Let's assume that our control strategy is to apply a force to the mass that is proportional to the difference between xd and x. Let's call this proportionality constant kp. The force is here, is what comes out of this block, is applied to the mass, and the mass moves by x of s. We can now imagine this as giving a command to the mass to go from the current position 0 to position xd. This distance times k p is f. So the position, so the force you apply to the mass will be very high at the beginning, and as the mass approaches xd, then the force decreases. What is the steady state error in this case? Well, the closed loop transfer function is x over xd, and this is kp over ms squared plus bs plus k plus kp. The error is simply xd, the desired output, minus the actual output, which is kp minus ms squared plus bs plus k plus kp times the input, which is xd. We can factor that out. And now let's give the system an input x of xd equals to a certain displacement. Let's call that displacement a small x x over s, x is the desired displacement, the magnitude of that displacement, and 1 over s represents the step input. We can find now the steady state error by setting the limit of e of s times s to 0, and this is xd is given there, x over s times s times this entire function, and this simplifies to k over k plus kp. This is now the steady state error. Can we make the steady state error zero by changing our gain kp? The answer is no.
there is no way the steady state error will go to zero. Why is that? Well, let's think again on the idea here of having the error or, or having the force being proportional to the error. If the mass starts at a position zero and you want the mass to go to position xd, at the beginning, the error is very large. The control effort, the force that comes out of this, which is proportional to this error, is very large. The mass then starts to move. And as the mass starts to move, this error decreases, the force decreases. What happens when the mass reaches xd? If the mass goes exactly to the position we want, then error at that point becomes zero. If the error becomes zero, then the force becomes zero. There is no force, there is no force applied to the mass, and the spring will pull the mass back. So the steady state error can never be zero. If the steady state error is zero, there is no force applied to the mass. According to the relation that we have here, according to our control strategy, it can never go to zero. Because once again, when the air is zero, the force applied to the mass is zero, and then the spring will simply pull the mass back. So in order for a force to be applied, the error here needs to be different than zero. This is the only way you get a force applied to the mass. And the steady state error can basically never be eliminated. It can be minimized. The greater kp, the smaller the steady state error. But the steady state error will never be zero. Now let's reconsider this example and let's get rid of that spring. So let's open the circuit there. And let's get rid of this spring. So there's no more spring here. Now k equals to zero. If there is no spring, k equals to zero, we are now left with a mass damper system. So this k goes to zero, and this k here goes to zero. Which means that the steady state error goes to zero. Why is that? We want the mass to go from zero to xd. The force is still proportional to this error, to the difference between these two. As the mass starts to move towards xd, the error decreases, the force decreases. When the mass now reaches xd, the force becomes zero because the error is zero. What happens at that point? Well, at that point, the spring is no longer there pulling the mass back. Once the force is zero, friction will simply let the mass stay out of that location and there is nothing pulling the mass back. And in this particular case, then the steady state error can indeed go to zero. So did we choose a bad controller here for our mass spring damper system? Not necessarily. This is a, a decent controller. The steady state error can be made very small. We can fix this issue using a different controller. The solution to this would be to add a integral controller here, but we'll deal with that in a separate lecture.